make a quick comment about these essays that you've been writing, okay? You don't need to be all peaches and cream on them, okay? Part of, of the reflection is, okay, that's not interesting to me. It can be, okay? Part of understanding what you want to do in the future is understanding things that you don't want to do, okay? You identify things that, oh, okay, that's an aspect that I would like to do. And you identify other things, no, that, that, that's definitely not interesting to me, okay? It's okay, you don't have to all say, environmental engineering is the most interesting thing, or, or acid drainage treatment with wetlands is the coolest thing I've ever seen. You don't have to say that if you don't believe it, okay? I want real reflections, what it really means to you. Okay? You can identify things that you don't want to do, identify things that you want to do, okay, and vice versa. Okay, so be honest. It's been strange reading all of these because they're 100% positive, okay? 100%. Hopefully you all, all do like it, but you should be identifying things that you like more than others, okay, as, as you go into the seminar. This, the main reason is to help you get direction as you uh, prepare yourself for your career, okay? All right, um, today we have Tobias Nagel from the Altoona Water Authority, and he's here to talk about the Altoona Water Authority and how that relates uh, to engineering and environmental engineering in specific. So with that, I give you Mr. Nagel. All right, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm not an engineer. Um, but our company has engineers on retainer, uh, and we staff three engineers in-house. So what I'm going to do today is go over an overview of our system, and you'll see the scope and the breadth of, of what we do, and hopefully you guys can pick out, and uh, I'll pick out areas that might be of interest or of things you don't want to do. <laughs> what you don't want to climb into one of our digesters to sample, uh, write, it, write about it next week. <laughs> yeah. um, I went to Penn State University um, for, as an environmental science um, major and uh, landed my first job with the Water Authority and have moved throughout the company over the years. Um, my job is, I love my job. Uh, your instructors will reach, you know, maybe 100 students through the year, um, a doctor might see a thousand patients each and every day. Um, what I do touches 62,000 people, and I, I, I really enjoy that part of my job. It's just a little part um, of my job to reach the 62,000, but it keeps us in on our toes. It makes me feel good about what I do, um, and that's what makes me want to get up at five in the morning. <laughs> So this is a presentation um, that was created when, when we almost had a hostile takeover. The politics of the situation about eight years ago was such that the, the local government didn't have enough money to, to pay its employees, so they thought a good idea would be to sell the water system. So this, this presentation was generated to, to show prospective buyers of what we were, what we had, um, so they could put a, a dollar figure on what we were worth. You should be able to just go uh, right, right click. Anyways, I'm going to blow through this stuff because there's a lot of writing. Um, but basically, um, one of the things that was important to prospective buyers is that we put about $180 million into the system. Um, in the last 15, about the last 20 years. Also, the Altoona Water Authority is the largest authority between Pittsburgh and uh, Harrisburg. And it's basically a, a, a child of the Pennsylvania Railroad system. That's important because as the railroad grew, so did the water company. So it's, it, it was a, a daisy chain type of thing. Right click ain't working. Or left click. There we go. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with Blair County, we reach pretty much from Tyrone to down to Haldysburg. We have uh, two systems. Um, there is the city system, and then there is the surrounding community system. 
which was called Blair Gap. Altoona took off with the Horseshoe Curve and, and sustained a, a fairly large amount of uh, people, but they ran out of space, so they, the railroad started developing the, the surrounding um, communities. Well, in the 80s, 1980s, with state federal regulations, those small communities couldn't keep up with um, reservoir maintenance or building filtration plants. So the authority, Altoona Water Authority, was created so that when we asked for $180 million, um, a town couldn't do that because it might bankrupt them. So authority was created for debt service primarily. Uh, we serve 70,000, I said 62. Um, this is about eight years old, so we've lost some, some population. We operate 12 reservoirs. Between the combination of all 12 reservoirs, about 2.8 billion gallons. Um, it's a lot of water. And we serve, I think, 14 uh, municipalities. Again, that's just uh, the scope of, of where we are. We have 23,000 customers, connections. Um, 21,000 are homes, 1,600 are commercial. We have industrial, institutional, and bulk sales like um, small towns will buy bulk water from us. We have uh, some Marcellus haulers that are bulk buyers. population. We have uh, seven sub-watersheds, two of which are impacted by uh, the AMI drainage. Uh, I suspect you guys do some work. Um, between those two, two of those seven watersheds, those two watersheds comprise nearly 40% of our supply. So 40% of our 2.8 billion is, uh, was low pH, high metal, um, high acidity water. Uh, that's changed over the last 15 years. Our well field, located right in the middle of town, has been abandoned. Um, there used to be some tanneries in, in the city of Altoona that you know really didn't take care of their chems very well or their waste products. And it has pretty much contaminated our, our well field to the point where it's, it's truly unusable. It's contaminated primarily with um, Trichloroethylene, ECE. Um, we have about 44,000 acres of, of watershed. It's primarily forested. That's a big deal. Um, the water quality coming off of that watershed should be pristine or, or pretty close to pristine. It's not like we've got 44,000 acres of, uh, of pavement or, or gas station runoff should be pretty good water, and it is. If you're familiar with Altoona, um, this Catani Point Reservoir is just downstream of the Horseshoe Curve. Um, the impounding dam is downstream of Catani Point, and then the, the last reservoir, Lake Altoona, um, is the last of the three. Mill Run Reservoir looks like a bass coming up and getting a, a mayfly. That's an Altoona Reservoir. Below our seven watersheds, um, we have seven water treatment facilities. The very top one, the Pappas Water Treatment Facility, is one of the watersheds that were severely impact, was severely impacted by my drainage. It is what's called a conventional system. Conventional treatment basically is, is collecting water, adding some, some chems for pH adjustment, um, as for some coagulation, flocculation, then you want to set, uh, have a set base. Um, that's what's, and then dull filters for filtration. That's conventional treatment. Um, you, add, you need the set base. The Bellwood Mill Run, Plain 9, Pippi, and Catacomber Gap are located downstream of, of all forested watersheds. So it's not as dirty water. You don't need the sedimentation step. So you can, you can have a smaller footprint for your water plant. It costs less, and it's all tied into what the water quality is from your source. Those, those 
Bottom six are what's called direct filtration. We collect it, ozonate it, put a coagulant in, um, and then we filter it right away. Um, the storms that came September 9th um, knocked out all of our direct filtration plants. Um, the water coming down off of the Allegheny Front came down so hard um, and had a large amount of turbidity, a large amount of sediment, and we couldn't filter and treat that water fast enough, so we were out of production for quite a while. Bellwood Water Treatment Facility is still out of production because of that event that happened um, in early September. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, Here, this third bullet here. My office is at the, the Horseshoe Curve water treatment plant, and it's a gold plant. Um, to secure the funding for that for that water treatment facility, they said, okay, we're going to send water, we're going to treat water and send it to Altoona, but at the same time, we're going to treat all of the acid mine drainage from Glenwood Watershed um, and do it uh, cheaply. Um, didn't work out that way. Spring flows and the the extent of the mine drainage was such that within a year we shut down the second half of the, the plant that was designed just for acid mine drainage um, because we couldn't it was breaking things um, when you would slow down um, mountain streams and dead of winter in the side basins you you would have big massive snow cones so all your mixtures all your, your pumps, you know, we would be burning things up. So that part of the plant was abandoned within a year of it coming online. And the other plant we focused on uh, keeping it running and supplying uh, residents of Clare County or residents of Altoona. <clears throat> That's where I work. The, the, the Andronic Pappas plant, it's also called the Horseshoe Curve plant. Nice place to go. Direct filtration facilities, I talked about that a little bit earlier. These are facilities that have pure or really um, pristine sources, um, and they skip a sedimentation step. They have a lower footprint, smaller footprint. The process basically, um, what you do is you bring the water in and you ozonate it. We, we, we generate, create ozone on site. Um, ozonate it, the water to oxidize metals and to break up any um, small organics. Um, then we, we uh, add a coagulant, try to fill the flocks, particles that we can filter. Then we filter it and then we do a pH adjustment, disinfect with chlorine gas, and then we add, we no longer add zinc orthophosphate for, for pipe protection. We, uh, we add a Polyphosphate. What that does is it protects the inside of water mains from, from corrosion, from oxidation. Ozone um, is a very electric intensive process. It takes a lot of electricity to generate ozone. Um, it also can be very dangerous if, if it escapes, it can make you sick. It escapes. It'll it'll chew up electric fixtures. You know, it's very uh, strong stuff. So our facilities all have monitors within them. Uh, if we have ozone leaks or ozone problems, um, you know, the facility will shut down, and all kinds of alarms are going to go off. No run is a direct filtration. Facility, Tipton's direct filtration, Kettle is a direct filtration, Bellwood, my hometown, Cumber Gap, and Plain Nine. The uh, ozone generators are on the top left. They sound like a spaceship going off all the time. It's this winding jet fuel or jet engine type sound. Traveling bridges is a, is a technique. Um, that Gwen Dobson Foreman 
and the Fuller Company came up with. Wind Dawson Form, by the way, is a, is a pretty renowned engineering company for water treatment located out in Fuller. Traveling bridge filters means that you can continue to filter water and wash the filters simultaneously. So traditionally, you would have to shut an entire bay down. You would lose half of your production just to wash a filter. When you have a traveling bridge, you can continually wash it and produce at the same time. <clears throat> um, and then just ozone tanks, rapid mix, and chemical addition ports within the, the plant. Water storage. So our plants are set up to, to hit certain water quality parameters, um, turbidity, pH, chlorine, and if they don't, our computer system, our SCADA system will shut them down. We do not have the capability of making bad water. We will shut ourselves down before we make bad water. This, however, becomes a problem. When you have a town or a system or a community that has downsized because industry leaves, and you got a town, system, or community that everyone in their own homes, when they want to replace their toilet, now gets a toilet that is a fifth of what it used to use. Same thing with shower heads, dishwashers, washing machines. When a system was designed to produce 20, 30 million gallons a day, you need all kinds of storage tanks. Now, because of industry shrinking and um, water efficient to uh, appliances and stuff. We have all these tanks and all this water that just sits there. All right. I got a call from Galactic Ice. Is anyone from the Altoona area? Galactic Ice? You guys know where that's at? It's an indoor skating rink. Um, they have ice skaters all year round. Galactic Ice called last week because the pH of their water is such that their chillers can't keep the ice frozen. All right, so they actually have to put in their own system to change, put some acetic acid, change the pH a little bit, uh, because we're sending them too high pH water. And here's what's happening. We're, we're not. Out of our plants, we're going out at a 7.5, but it's coming into these tanks and just sitting there. What's happening is, um, this is what I think, not what I know. So <laughs> if you're a scientist or an engineer, you might not like this. But when water ages and, um, and warms up, historically, and I looked at this five-year trend, our pH climbs in these storage tanks. And, and I'm not exactly sure why, but it, from tank to tank to tank, um, this is happening, especially in July, August, and September. So black guys really don't care about you know why or what my excuses are. They just know that it's gonna cost them more money to keep their ice frozen. And the whole the whole dynamic is because all of these tanks that we have are are oversized now because of the changes that happened in our community. <coughs> you guys with me? So engineer me something to fix that problem. <laughs> oh one of the other things too about the change in pH Remember where the water's coming from. It's coming from the Allegheny Front. Um, it, it's a, it's a, like a freestone watershed. There's no limestone up there. So the, the alkalinity in that source water is very low. So if there was some buffering capacity in our water, um, the pH would not change as significantly in our tanks when it just sits there. Any questions? Our tanks is Fairview Hills. Um, no longer looks like that. It, we got um, hooked up with a bunch of cell companies. Now there's all kinds of antennas and all kinds of stuff on that one. Um, and there's just pictures of other facilities. This one right here, and this is just a, a little around the beer story that I have. When I first started coming to work at the authority, this was painted. This tipped in water tank was painted. And, you know, I'm right out of college, and I'll do whatever you guys want me to do. Just tell me what to do. And they said, well, we got a, we, we got a job for you. I want you to climb up on top of that tank 
and get some, some total call forms. So, so, um, they had just painted it, they had to disinfect it, and before it went back into service, they had to make sure it was clean. So I said, oh yeah, it's a job for me, no problem. So I went up on a November morning and uh, got on top of the tank and realized that it was so cold that night that it was a sheet of ice. So I immediately went down on my belly like this and barely caught the back end of the the ladder or I fell off the side. <laughs> and it was because you know, I was gung ho. Right out of college, I'll do whatever you guys want. And I didn't think about you know, that temperature thing. It didn't rain the night before, but uh, condensation froze on top of the tank. <clears throat> How high is that tank? Oh, it was at least 50 feet high. At least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And here's another problem. Not only do we have too much storage capacity, we also have 380 miles of main underground. So if it's not sitting in our tanks not being used, it might be sitting in our you know, water lines that are oversized. Now. Distribution. Uh, this really isn't. <laughs> or sexy, but here this is this is what's going on. Uh, Karst topography, you know, we got all kinds of elevation changes within our system, so you need booster stations um, because we can't move reservoirs. But sometimes people will build homes on the side of a mountain. We don't have the elevation to get the water there, so we have numerous pump stations throughout our 380 miles of Maine, um, and there's the list of them. <coughs> hydrants. Hydrants do nothing for a water company. Absolutely nothing. It doesn't change our water quality. Um, it does nothing but cost us money. It is a service to you, though, who have a, has a home. Uh, you need it there. So if your house catches on fire, you can put it out. Um, but if we simply need some area in our distribution system to blow off water, blow off pressure, we can do it with a blow off valve, not hydrants. Each hydrant costs about four to five thousand dollars. We absorb that cost, um, but we do it because that's a community need. Banks won't lend you a couple million dollars to build a uh, a ball field or a stadium if you don't have fire protection. Um, insurance companies won't insure you if you land an engineering job and build a $2 million house unless there's a hydrant nearby. That hydrant also has to have a certain flow and pressure that in case your $2 million home catches on fire, it actually has to work and put it out. So we have 17, 1800 hydrants in our system have to be tested <clears throat> every two years for flow or pressure and, and who we charge. Nobody. It's just the simple cost that we must absorb. But anyways, that's, a, that's why that's here. But that's part of a water system. That's just how we move water around. That's what it looks like. When you're in a residential community, you gotta make it look nice, make it look pretty. Again, it does nothing for us. It doesn't do anything with water quality, anything for production. These are costs that we, we have to absorb. And then when you're, when you're out in the middle of the woods, you can just put a simple chain link fence up and may, maybe paint it. <laughs> Watershed protection. Um, when I decided I didn't want to fall off tanks anymore and work in a lab, I sort of migrated toward watershed protection. Um, it's probably one of the, the, my favorite things um, to do. And I started the program. We developed a plan to sort of get a baseline of, of what we have um, so if things go wrong, you know, we'll, we'll know where we were and where we want to be. <clears throat> Every water system in Pennsylvania had to do a source water assessment 
and then a protection plan after 9-11. Um, you know, how, how many acres of forest or watershed do you have? Is it secure? Is it susceptible to, you know, train hijacking or, or whatever? So everybody had to look at this, you know, at 2003, 2004. We took the next step. At the Water Authority, Altoona Water Authority, not only did we learn what we had and the basic baseline characteristics that we had, but we understood that when you have 44,000 acres of watershed, you need some help. You can't ask employees to, to patrol all of that. So what we did was, through our watershed protection plan, we reached out to PennDOT and said, hey, when you apply herbicides to your street signs or to um, the sides of roads, when they're, when they're running alongside our, our watershed or our reservoirs, what are you putting on it? Well, who, who are you again? I said, well, I'm from the water company and I care. So we started building connections and bridges with people systems that were never there because of the source water protection. We work, so we work with PennDOT. We work with the Game Commission. The Game Commission, anybody like the Game Commission? Yeah, me neither. Um, the Game Commission, most of their holdings are in the middle of the woods where, where you never see it. So sometimes they will do a timber harvest without any corroboration with the municipalities or anyone downstream. So they would log above our reservoirs, they would dirty up and create all kinds of trouble for us. So through this protection plan, we started talking with the Game Commission, we started working with them, and then eventually we ended up giving them 10,000 acres for the public to be able to hunt on. Here's the, here's the kicker for, or here's the good thing for us, here's the carrot. Now we have 10,000 acres that were unpatrolled unsecured, that anybody could do whatever they wanted to it. When we when we went into the co-op, the land co-op with the Game Commission, now we have control of it. And it's a, it's a good, you know, community outreach thing. More and more land's being posted for hunters, and when you open it up, as a government, you know, people start to like that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a little dated. We have had successful implement implementation of the plan. The plan was not just community partnerships, but we needed to educate people. When I go into a, a classroom, elementary classroom, high school classroom, even college classroom, you ask people, where's your water come from? And they look at the faucet. Well, I mean, before the faucet, and people don't know. So we've done a lot of education with our, with our local schools and Penn State Altoona, Penn State Maine, now St. Francis, do a lot of education. <clears throat> the ownership, we, we own about, well, it's 10,000 acres now. Um, but the entire watershed is 44,000 acres. Prospect Tank is a tank that was right in the middle of um, Altoona, um, and it was a tank that wasn't painted, that did have ugly rusted fence. And what we did was, when we replaced it, we downsized it, and then we made it into what looked like a, uh, a railroad roundhouse, where back in the old days, when they switched trains, they used roundhouses. So this now this huge water tank looks like a railroad roundhouse, and, and that actually had a tremendous amount of engineering costs associated with that. Uh, but it's a good thing. This is the tank I'm talking about. It's now complete. Another, uh, another part of the project was to get the community to buy into it. We rehabilitated a pool that was next door to it. We have, uh, right now, um, this Blair Gap Dam has been fixed, repaired. Every one of our dams, which we have two, 12 of them, get inspected annually. And it, it, it's working out now that they're on the tail end of their lifespan. Um, that we have a lot of repairs to do. Right now we have 
Um, one, that all of the upfront engineering work is done. We just need to find some funding for it. It's going to be about a $20 million project. And another, Bellwood, is um, at the very beginning stages of, of repairs and engineering. Um, so we have a lot of reservoir dam work coming up. Spillways. Uh, one of the, my old jobs was you have to monitor source water sometimes, and, and not just in the mountain streams coming down, but what's going on in the reservoirs. So another one of the things that I did was I used to walk off across the top of these things um, just to get algae samples and DO profiles within the reservoir. And uh, that is probably 40 feet up. That's pretty foolish thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then this just goes on and on and on. We have line, um, as, as our pipes age, and some of our mains are 100 years old, they're sort of like, you know, our circulatory system, you know, it gets gunked up. We get gunked up for uh, cholesterol and fat. Our water lines sometimes get gunked up with, um, you know, iron, manganese, just oxidation, uh, turbicules or whatever they're called. So we have to reline, we have to clean them and reline them. It's a lot easier and more cost efficient to do that than to rip up um, downtown up here. <clears throat> and again, we have like 380 miles of main. Completed uh, a dam repair at Tipton. It only cost 300,000. We replaced the caps. <coughs> we shot grout. <coughs> and some of the joints. And then again, on the downstream face, you can grout um, without shooting um, the grout. And that's what we did there. And this is the, the finished product. More uh, water storage tank work. Demolition construction of Oakton. That's about a 7 million gallon. Uh, tank. Anyways, all these numbers basically show the company that wanted to buy us that hey, we put 83 million in our water storage, treatment, and distribution system. Another 25.5 million in our reservoirs for a total of 109 million. Okay, so I don't know what kind of time we have, but I, I got the same thing with the wastewater. Again, it's the same thing. There's a whole lot of engineering going on. There, there's things that, that people don't even know about. Um, distribution, storage, raw water storage, treatment. We got lab work. You got five to ten. Five to ten minutes? Okay. Yeah, that's, I, I'm just going to wind it up and we'll just talk. You know, if it's okay with you. Um, one thing I did want to say uh, was in a few years, if not next year, you'll be going to prospective employers. Um, I know you're smart. If, if you would be coming to my door, I know you're smart. You, you have a degree now. Uh, you know the theory. You can work things out. But what I'm looking for is someone to be more than just smart. Someone needs to be dynamic. Some, because I'm smart too. I did the same thing. You know, we can work on problems together. But I need you to complement. You know what I don't have. So I don't know if you can get it in your engineering courses, or um, you know you can pick it up somewhere else. But like right now, I need someone to go in and teach in an elementary school. All right, and I don't have that at our place of work. I also need someone that can do some lab work. So next year when we hire someone, I'm probably going to be looking for a chemist with a good personality to be honest with you. Someone that smiles. Someone that's not going to scare a kid away. 
when I take them out of the lab and send them to the school. Sure, you want a chemist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, I don't know what that means to you, but but you need more than just the degree, especially in this climate that, that you guys are, are going to be entering as far as the job market. Um, Marcellus Shale, I mean, they simply need warm bodies. Maybe that's an avenue you guys want to do. Um, but outside of Marcellus Shale, it's a little tough right now. Some of you may already know that. So you got to have more than just smarts. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Is this what you were looking for? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in regards to Marcellus Shale, what? This is what I think, not what I know, okay? <clears throat> right now, in my part of the world, we don't have much development. Um, if you would ask me three years ago, if I would have said, you know, that the world's gonna come to an end because of Marcellus Shale, and, and this is why I felt this way. Um, we had a whole bunch of Texas drillers come into Pennsylvania. Um, they, they were used to a different set of regulations, a different climate, and a different landscape. So the way they drilled wells in Texas um, didn't work here. Over the last three years, I think um, we're getting better, and they're getting better at siting wells, regulating wells, constructing wells. Are we there yet? I don't think so feel better than I did three years ago. I also, when I, when I was your, you know, you guys' age, um, I had this perspective that any kind of corporation, any kind of business, any kind of government was really bad. And they didn't know what they were doing. And, and I knew everything. And the reality is we're responsible for footprints in our society. You know, we need that natural gas, whether it's for running a facility or employing people, you know, we need that. Um, you know, we need big, dirty industrial factories and cogen plants. We need that. Um, but back then, I just didn't like any kind of business, any kind of corporation, because I thought they were all bad and just trying to take our money and make me sick. Does that answer your question? That's what I think. By the way, that's what I think. <laughs> um, we have been approached with some drillers, and they've been pretty good. The last thing you want to do, the first thing you want to do is get your community to buy into things, buy into the concept of, you know, Marcellus drilling. And, and the way they do that is they'll hire a few locals, They'll spread some of their money around by buying water off of the water facility or, you know, repaving roads that, that they're traveling throughout the community. So they are learning that, and they're doing more and more of that type of stuff to, to make it more palatable for a community to accept it. But the reality is there's not a whole lot you can do, you know, because most landowners like us, we don't own the middle of the gas and the oil rights, so they can drill. Questions? By the way, they're constructing wells, the, the casings a lot differently, so there's less and less problems. <laughs> Any other questions? questions? What's the um, budget, uh, you know, the wastewater side relative to the Drinking water side. Where do you where where does more money get? Uh, Wastewater. Fifty fifty. Wastewater. Um, it's really hard to treat wastewater. Um, chemistry is easy. Chemistry is cool. I mean, you just add a little caustic soda or, or add a little oxygen. But when you have to worry about microbes doing your your cleaning, they're very finicky as far as climate, temperature, flow. And there's there's a lag period, so you, wastewater is a lot more difficult for us. We got the chemistry, the water treatment down pretty well. 
and, it, and again, it goes back to source water. It's, our source water is not real, real flashy. Most of our water is coming from a mountain. We know what that mountain's given us. We know that mountain's covered, sort of, so to speak. So we know what's coming at us, so the chemistry is pretty easy. If you're looking for numbers, um, wastewater, wastewater budget's about one and a half times what our water budget is. Anything else?